Ladies and gentlemen, this is the exceptional one, Kim McClinton. I want to thank you so much for stopping past. We are not ashamed of the good news of conservatism, for it is the power of liberation, first to the Republican and then the Socialists. This evening we have a very special interview. Along the lines of what's happening on the streets in Washington, D.C., and as well around the country. Um, Tracy Cooper, the mother of a young man named Keith, was shot in the back six times. And she died on her front steps on the afternoon of May the 16th. There have been developments since that particular time period, and we will make you aware of those as we proceed through this particular night. The reason why I wanted to do this is to make you aware that there are many, many concerns on this anniversary of D-Day. And um, unfortunately, there seems to be a war in the inner city that is not being dealt with by our culture. In fact, it's kept apart from, seemingly denied, and often explained away. But ladies and gentlemen, when women are dying in our streets, children are dying in our streets, drug trafficking and firearm possessions throughout the city, even though there are laws against it. And uh, most importantly, the laws are against those who would be law-abiding to protect themselves. Uh, there is a definite need for a response from our culture. A response that's just not the norm. So what we're going to do right here as time is moving steadily from us, I want you to put your heart, hand over your heart, your right hand over your heart. I want to join me in pledging allegiance to the United States of America. Join the children. There we are, ladies and gentlemen. It is nothing like having the very young people uh, lead us. Tonight I am about to contact uh, the Reverend Esther Williams. She is the cousin of Tracy Cooper. We want to dialogue about tonight's issue the murder of Tracy Cooper. Good evening. This is Ken McClinton, the exceptional conservative. Hello. This is Ken McClinton, the exceptional conservative, attempting to contact. Hi. Hello, Reverend. Hi, how are you? Well, and yourself, Reverend. Um, not doing, not, not doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. <laughs> Coming from a meet, as a matter of fact. Wow. All right. I can understand. Um, you are the cousin of Tracy Cooper, 
Am I correct? Yes, I am. All right. Uh, and if we could express uh, in just a, a few words, uh, or, or just a description, if I were to walk up on Tracy Cooper, how would I describe her? What would her personality be like? Her personality was loving and joyful, and she loved family. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, were you very close to your cousin? Um, yeah, we were close. She was the one after um, um, the older generation kind of, kind of uh, uh, passed away who um, loved to have the cookout. Um, she wanted to be a great cook like her grandmother, and so uh. she kept... Anything she could do to have a cookout, a gathering, she did it. Oh, ah, she seems like a very tremendous woman. Yeah, she was. Um, you know, in recent months, she was. Um, she was a little slow. She had uh, aneurysm surgery um, in November. Wow. Wow. So she was moving a little slow, you know, but she was, she still had that pretty smile and that bubbling, bubbling face of hers. Now, now, she had aneurysm surgery, which in days, yeah. days of yore, if you had an aneurysm, uh, you know, there, there wasn't very much hope for you. She survived the surgery. Right. Uh, yeah. That, how was she being taken care of? Was she standing alone? Was she a very vibrant, independent woman? Well, she she had a home health aide nurse. Um, as a matter of fact, that that who had dropped her off. That she had taken her grocery shopping, and she had just dropped her off. And you know, she believed in being independent um, as much as she could. And so, um, when she was going in the house with her groceries, when she was shot. Wow. Now, to, to take us to that particular afternoon. She she's coming home. She's just been dropped off. She's going up the stairs, uh, and someone approaches her. H how does this happen? Um, we 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 don't even know. Uh, we saw it on the news. That's how we found out. Um, and we happened to see this woman was, you know, what they showed was the woman. She hadn't even got up the stairs yet, and um. She had been shot, and the grocery bags were just scattered all over the ground. Yeah. Now, she had been shot how many times in the back? Six times in the back. Six times in the back. So it wasn't a one-time mistake. It was a definite, intentional assassination. Right. Now, why would they go after Tracy Louise Cooper? She seemed just the very sweetest of women, and... and seemed unable to take care of herself, well, at least to protect herself, at least. Right, and, and that's, those are the answers that we're looking, we're, we're asking questions. Um, we don't know. Um, like I said, she, you know, we don't know. Wow. Uh, now, tonight we're talking with Reverend Esther Williams, who is the cousin of Tracy Louise Cooper. 45-year-old mother who was shot six times in the back while walking up her front steps on the afternoon of May the 16th. Um, now, and, and forgive me, some of these questions are very personal. Uh, what support, what help have you been receiving from the detectives? What help support have you received from uh, outsiders, family, church? Uh, what support have you, has the family received? Um, well, we, we, we um, the detectives um, who was assigned to the case has been um, very, very helpful to um, to my cousin, her brother. We're not going to give his name out, exactly. um, but he, you know, he's been very helpful to him um, in a way of you know um, making sure everything was all right. We have a GoFundMe page uh, to try to raise money um, to bury her, and. Um, you know, we've just been trying to raise funds. Outside of that, you know, it's just been the family, and we've been reaching out to various um, organizations, various people to try to get some assistance 
with the GoFundMe. Yes. Now, has the uh, victims specialist unit for the Metropolitan Police Department, have they provided any assistance to the family? Um, none that I know of. Okay. Now, in, in this particular shooting, uh, her shooting was not alone on that particular day, and they, according to police, they seem to be connected. Um, apparently... Yeah, that's, that's what... Okay. Yes, uh, apparently a Tavon Devontae Cummings, 22, was fatally shot. He was five blocks away and was killed on the driveway of his home. Um, right. And, and they said that there's a connection between the two families. What exactly is the connection? I don't know because yeah. I don't even know who that is. Yeah. Um, the first time we heard about a connection was when they said it on the news when the um, when the um, chief of police um, and and um, other police officers were speaking. Um, we don't know. Yeah. I don't know her. Her brother doesn't know. You know, nobody in the family knows who that person is. There were four people killed that day. Yes. Okay. And the assertion that's being made by the Washington Post uh, is that this may have been drug related or gang related of some type. Uh, Tracy Louise Cooper certainly was not a member of a gang or drugs uh, or involved in drug movement. No. Yeah. Uh, no, she was not. She was. The, she didn't do drugs. No. Nor was she involved in any activities like that either. Exactly. Was her son involved in those activities? Um, now, that might be. I, I, I don't know for sure. Um, the family really didn't deal with him too much because he was a little out of control. Ah, okay. But, but and the reason I bring that up is because there are a lot of families in D.C. who have individuals who are are going along the a different route in life uh and right. their family is trying to do all that they can to help them uh sometimes exactly. sometimes protect them uh and keep them from mm -hmm. harm and danger and unfortunately mm -hmm. their lifestyle comes back to the house exactly now as a minister and i know that this is a very tough time to have to bury your cousin mm -hmm. Um, but this is not isolated, am I correct? Uh, you serve with a lot of young people. You understand uh, that this is epidemic in Washington, D.C. Yes, it is. I mean, it, it, it really is an epidemic. Um, it's it, it heart-wrenching, to be very honest with you, because I know people are kings and queens, and we don't have a lot of advocacy out there for them to let them know that they are kings and queens, to let them know that they are better than that. Um, you know, there are a few that you can grab and, you know, you can show them love. And a lot of them, that's what they're missing. They're missing, they're missing that love. And then you have the others who, even though they're getting that love, you know, they still tend to go to the left. Yeah. You know, and, um, and it's very helpful because... You know, I, I am a good pastor, and I, and I do want to, you know, do what I can to give back to the young people because we all do that to them. Exactly. We, we really do. We, we owe that to them. Um, I got Anna Van Zandt said it, said it very good um, when she went up to, I think that was Detroit, when a young man got killed. And, you know, we are, we are the elders now, and so we owe them that responsibility to show them some love, to, to give them some wisdom, because the street is not giving them wisdom. Mm -hmm. And we know that. And we know we can't save everybody. No. But I encourage my young people who are on the, on the road to doing great things to go back and pull a few out and show them that this road to success can be made. And we have we have young people in DC who are doing positive things. One of the things I would love to see is a mentorship program for the young people by young people. Mm -hmm. and that would be an awesome program. 
um, you know, I, I Mary Bird was, was to me was 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 a matriarch. Um, she loved his young people, and 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 he made things so that they would have something to do. Um, I heard someone say not too long ago that you know our young people are are, are feeling hopeless. The young man said that on the news um, the day of the shooting. You know when they did the um, when they did the march yeah. just last week. Mm-hmm. You know, and they are they, they they want love too. They want understanding too. Exactly, but it doesn't help uh, in this aspect because we're talking with Reverend Esther Williams, a youth pastor, Washington D.C., who over the weekend buried her cousin uh, Tanya Louise Cooper, forty-five, uh, who happened to be walking up the stairs of her home with her groceries uh, when she was fired upon six times in her back. Now, uh, this is a gun bad city, am I correct? Uh, it, we're not supposed to have guns uh, at this particular juncture. Uh, uh, but it, it doesn't seem like the gun ban is affecting anyone but those who can't protect themselves. Am I right about that? or? or... I, I, I would agree with you 100% on that. Now, uh, now, would you believe that Tanya, Tr- I'm sorry, Tracy Cooper would have wanted an opportunity to protect herself? No. And why do you say she, no? No. Well, because of the fact that the type of person that she was, she was a kind hearted person. She loved young people herself. And she believed in loving, loving on the young people. So, you know, she wasn't that type of person that would feel as though she needed that because she loved God too. Yeah. And so, you know. So she she um, never she didn't have a lifestyle that would uh, I, there was no need in her particular lifestyle to feel the need for protection. She basically placed her life and her wholeness in God, and and so be it accordingly, right? Correct, correct, yeah. correct. But is is that a message that is being refuted every single day? However, uh, by the no. drug dealers and and the like in Washington D.C. No, I don't think it is. Okay. I, I really don't. Like I said, we, we have a lot of young people that are lost. And, okay. um, you know, the only thing you hear on TV and news are the bad things, but you never hear about some of the young people who have gone back to reach back into the community to to get some of, it, some of their brothers and bring them up and their mm-hmm. sisters and, and, and train them and talk to them. Now, you never see that. And I think a, a lot of the churches need to band together. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the two ministers that were um, that did the march, and they said that they were going to have a few more marches. Mm-hmm. You know, people need to start standing up. You know, it takes a village to raise children, and we don't have that concept anymore. Mm-hmm. Now, are churches beginning to reach out in, the, in your community, at least, uh, in the 49th street area of southeast washington dc are there people who are reaching out and saying hey what can we do to help in this particular community because we know that there is a great need some people are doing this some people are reaching out and starting to you know say what can we do to stop the violence in washington dc what can we do for the young people to help stop the violence Mm -hmm. and we do have some people in the community doing that okay so what solutions, if Tracy would like to offer any, what do you think Tracy would offer in terms of solutions for this particular situation? Um, would it be uh, some type of jobs program? Would it be a, uh, a, a program or, or a way of stopping the drug traffic in D.C.? How, how, how do you deal with all of the issues uh, that surround the many deaths that are happening in Washington D.C. I think I think it was a combination of um, all of the above. Um, you know, more mentoring programs for young people, more programs where they can learn a trade. You know, D.C. used to be a place where when you went to school, you learned a trade. 
they shut down most of the trade schools. Um, the No Child Left Behind is a joke. And, you know, a lot of times our children need to learn by hands on, you know, more mentors. We need more mentors out there, more, you know, more of our men and women out there, you know, to meet the kids where they are. Young people just want you to meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a lot of people who, who are, you know, clergy and not to take away from anybody, but... You know, I can't I can't reach a young person if I want him to believe that I've been saved all my days and I don't do any wrong. Because the word of God clearly states that we sin on a daily basis and we all have fallen short. Yes. Exactly. You know, and so when I minister to my young people, I let them know I I have faults. Mm -hmm. I'm not perfect by no means. But I can show you how I can work on those imperfectness that I had. Yes. You know, and, and I and my in my heart I believe that if we as a people, you know, start banding together and stop saying this is not my problem, it is your problem. Because that's my son. I may not have birthed him, but he's still my child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and this is what we used to do. And if we go back to the things we used to do I think that a lot of things will change. Exactly. Now, because they do want love. They, they do want this. Now, the sad thing is that we have both buried people that we love. Um, yeah. And the cameras around for a short period of time, the politicians all come and they make promises. Uh, right. There are people who reach out and say, you know, I'll be there with you. Just let me know what you need, and then you don't see them anymore. Right. For the clergy, we have a clarion call here, and that's to get outside of the four right. walls, out of the ivory tower, and begin right. preaching uh, in the streets and, and reaching the young people and the elders as well. Uh, Isn't that what Jesus Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Excellent. Exactly what he said, dude. Uh, you can't win souls if you stay all your days inside the house. Uh, but in in the sense of the political process in D.C., um, is there something that politicians need to know uh, about this crisis that they can help with? I think they need to work on more legislation in the District of Columbia. Columbia, where they can have programs for um, for the young people uh, in D.C. Um, a lot of the things that they used to have, you know, they say the budget can't take it, or when they're running, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, but then it never happens because, you know, to me, they're looking at the fact that, oh, we just want to rejuvenate the District of Columbia and make it something totally different. Well, you still don't have a problem. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you question them about, well, what are you going to do about the problem, then, you know, they give you a lot of rhetoric, but they never come through with what they're going to do. Yeah. You know, and yeah. we put them in office. So at the end of the day, I think if, if, if we band together to say, look, this is what we want done, and if you can't fulfill this, and you're not the politician for us. Exactly. I think what we have lost is the fact that we vote them in office. And if we don't get out there and stand for what's right in our community and, and put the right people in office and stop allowing the media to make something look one way when it's not reading between the lines, mm -hmm. we're going to continue to be lost. Now, you also have individuals who are neighbors, uh, who see nothing and say nothing uh, because they got to save their children, they got to save their own lives. Is, is, it time for the right. is it time for neighbors to start really being neighbors again? It is. It really is. It, it, takes, it takes a village. It takes a village. That, that old adage will never go away. Never. When 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 I was younger, 
it took a village, and I'm sure the same thing for you. Um, Miss Jones was if Miss Jones saw you doing something down the street and corrected you, she handled it, and then mom and dad handled it when you got home. Who lost that? Yes, yes. Now, in a court document, prosecutors wrote. Um, about Keith Cooper. He says, apparently drug dealing while keeping a firearm and various sorts of ammunition around and his mother was murdered in front of her house that he shares with her under some sort of circumstances that led the defendant to threaten deadly retaliation against both the person he suspects for his mother's murder and that person's family. This is not an a extraordinary situation. There are people that know who yeah. did what and just won't say anything. For fear of retaliation. Yes, yeah, they won't. And, right, right. And I can understand that. And I and I really can understand that. Yeah. Um, you know, we live in a society where um um you know, no nobody wants to say anything because we're afraid. Yeah. Um, you know, and I can understand that too. I, I, I don't you know, I don't really know how to address that, you know. Um, are there some ways? Personally, yeah. are, are there some ways I that walk we, with God? Yeah, are, are there? And, and I agree with you. Uh, but are there some ways that we can deal with the retaliation issue in our city? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, a, a lot of what what you hear a lot, a lot of the the people in Ward Seven and Eight talk about is the lack of police police protection, you know, in their area. Um, it's everywhere else, but in their area. So, I mean, granted, if, if, if I know that these people are running around and they can retaliate on me at any given time, I, I wouldn't want to say anything either. And I know that the police are not going to protect me. Yeah. And so you're, you're pretty much in a, uh, darn if you do, darn if you don't situation. You want to do something right. Yeah. But you don't want to right. lose your family in the process, uh, right? Exactly, exactly. You really, you really don't. You don't want to lose your family. I mean, you know, it's it's it's, it's hard on it's hard on families to lose a loved one, um, and that's anybody's family. Yeah. Um, you know firsthand, you know, um, and and all of it's senseless. It, it's 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 meaningless. It's not going to get anybody anywhere. You know, but um, my my prayers go out. I pray for the people who have done this to my cousin. Yes. I pray for them. Because at the end of the day, we all got to judge. We got to go see. Yes. Whether you believe in it or not, exactly. you got to face judgment. You know, and a lot of times, you know, God will bring death or a loss of someone um, in order to improve something. Or yeah. something greater to be done. Exactly. As and, and that's my desire. That's my hope. I, you know, as I said, I, you know, in watching you and your wife, you know, advocate for your daughter is not, you know, you all are not advocating for, um, you know, you're advocating for others, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing, and I love that. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm because you, you all want to see other young people grow and let them know that hey life doesn't have to be about this exactly exactly reverend esther williams um as a fellow minister of the gospel of jesus christ sometimes you don't know how great he is until you need him most and it seems that when the moment the of life. grieving comes uh that's when you need him most i, I want to ask you and, and finality, and I want to thank you so much for taking time to be with us tonight and talk about uh, Tracy Cooper and this situation. Is there anything that our audience can do to help you in this situation? I, I mean, not everybody uh, is ready uh, or able to handle this uh, terrible thing. Um, funeral cost, family mm -hmm. cost, continue mm -hmm. living. Uh, 
and and then you have house situations and and uh, there's just a lot. Um, just a lot. It is. Okay, and, and, and I, I think they need to have a form a form. Um, in in uh in DC, I think they need to have a form with with clergy and and other people, other advocates that want to band together and to put some things down. Um, I know uh, about two years ago, um, Eleanor Holmes went and called a forum together for clergy of every religion um, for the HIV and AIDS epidemic in Washington, D.C. So why can't we call a forum together for something like this? To help our young people, to help them grow, to see our young people become politicians, to see them become lawyers and judges, it can be done. Exactly. But they need, some of them need that backing. Some of them come from homes where that's all that they've ever seen is hardship. And so who's out there advocating for them? Who's out there trying to help them and show them that you don't have to be your circumstances. You can be beyond your circumstances. Amen. Now, I hope that you'll work with me in putting that, that forum together. Uh, in a quick and soon way because there's a lot that needs to be done for our community and it's not going to get done if you keep waiting for people across the river uh, to do it for you. How can people support you uh, in this particular regard? Because I know that there are a lot of bills that come through the door uh, with someone else's name on it but with uh, your requirement to pay it. Uh, how can people support you? Um. Right, right now, we need just need the uh, the GoFundMe. We have a GoFundMe out there um, to um, so that we can, you know, put her to rest. Yeah. Um, and then from there, um, I, I would love to get a forum together where we could just talk, um, you know, and have advocates and, and clergy to get together to see what we can do to help. Because as you said, you know, the church. The churches can help. The churches can develop programs right there in their churches so that the young people can have something to go to every day. It can be done. Mm -hmm. it, can it can be, be done. It can be indeed. Uh, now, that GoFundMe uh, page, and uh, let me just run up real quick and uh, do a quick research because we're talking with Reverend Esther Williams, the cousin of Tracy Cooper and my wife and I started open heart closed case with the passing of our daughter uh, when she was killed mm -hmm. uh, last year uh, and unfortunately there has been no resolution to her case and we were blessed in a fashion the, I, I, the, uh, where uh, there were supporters uh, through the Victim mm -hmm. Specialist Unit of the Metropolitan Police Department, uh, and as well her mm -hmm. own health and life insurances and things that covered. Um, but not everyone is blessed in that particular capacity. And so uh, I, right. my wife and I encourage people uh, to go to the gun, GoFundMe uh, page for funeral expenses for Tracy Cooper. Uh, and I'm going to put that in our chat roll. Uh, listen, we're not asking you to break the bank this month, uh, and I don't want you giving and then coming back into my chat roll later on and saying, Ken, I gave my mortgage money. <laughs> Can you help me? That's not what we're exactly. trying to do. Um, but every little bit can help. They're looking to raise $15,000. Uh, and yeah. you can find it at GoFundMe.com backslash 255 S is in Sam, F is in Frank, Q is in Queen, 7, C is in Christ. Uh, those, Correct. that backslash again is 255, S is in Sam, F is in Frank, Q is in Queen, 7, C is in Christ. This is for the funeral expenses for Tracy Cooper. Um, and she was buried, am I correct? Or is not, she, yet. not yet. No, she is not. Okay. Uh, when is the expected burial for Miss Cooper? Um, we don't know. We don't. We don't know right now. We're okay. still trying to um to raise, you them. know, get some funds together. Yeah. yeah, she didn't have any um any insurance. 
Um, unfortunately, so many of us don't. Um, that's another thing that uh, one of the gentlemen that's going to help, I don't have his name and his information, but he does seminars. Um, he he owns, um, he does a lot of funerals for people less fortunate. Yeah. Um, and tries to help them out. And I really want to get his information out there, too, because he, he is he's doing a great work. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, we, we are... We're trying to get it together. I've been putting it out there. I've been sending it to various people so that, um, you know, we can get the funds so we can be able to get her um, put away nicely. Well, I, I tell you what, we will continue to support you in this endeavor uh, and encourage you in this endeavor. Our audience is open to that. We will also make certain uh, that this is passed on around the country uh, so that there will be others that can provide the support you need uh, there there is a rest that civilized people give their own even when uncivilized people have done things to create chaos and misery in other people's lives Tracy right. Cooper didn't deserve the death that she received and she certainly does not deserve going unburied so uh, let us yeah. do everything that we can uh, in helping Reverend Esther Williams and her family in supporting uh, and making uh, the funeral expenses available uh, to satisfy the outstanding need. Uh, Reverend, thank I thank you, you so, much. so much for coming on the air with me tonight and just being as in this most grievous time, just being honest uh, and Fort Worth, uh, I'm Fort um, and worthy uh, of talking about Tracy Cooper and her life. And I thank you so much. I thank you so much. And, um, you know, I hope we can uh, actually get together and, and try to start working on getting some things done. Um, because a lot of times we wait for the politicians, but sometimes we as a people, we have to start doing it ourselves. Exactly. I believe in that. And um, I, I, I think that would be a great honor to Tracy and her life. Um, if we would start doing that for our young people, um, that is really a passion of mine. I, I really have always enjoyed ministering to to young people um, because I had I had a past once before in my life, like a lot of other people who sometimes get in church and forget that they came from a past. Exactly. And so, you know, my desire was to give back to my young people um, to let them know that they are worth a whole lot indeed indeed reverend williams uh, i want you also to go to the open heart closed case on facebook and like it we're going to work together and we are going to change washington okay. dc our daughter and our okay. your cousin's lives will not be in vain sounds great awesome I thank you so much thank you god bless you i look forward to talking with you very soon god bless all right. God bless you, too. Thank you. Thank you. That was the Reverend Esther Williams. And I, I want you all to understand, especially clergy, if you're paying attention, because I know clergy get up in the pulpits on Sunday mornings and you roast me and you tell me that I'm being very critical of the church uh, and that I am, how dare you criticize the church if you're inside the church. Listen, your greatest critique will not come from the one who knows you your greatest critique will come from the ones who should have known you and wish they had known you and known the grace and the mercy that we all have just by professing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior Lord God I ask you right now to protect the family of Tracy Cooper I ask you right now Father God to open the hearts and minds and the souls and even the persons Lord God of those Lord who can provide the support that they need to give a rest to Miss Cooper I also ask you Lord God in this age where the lives of women and children mean absolutely nothing and they're being slaughtered at will I ask right now that you open the eyes and the hearts and the minds of your people 
that they can see for themselves that death doesn't have a political party. Death doesn't have a status of rich and poor. But death does leave a belingering and smoldering impact on the lives of victims and their families. I ask you right now, Father God, for people to be honest and earnest that we have a drug crisis in Washington, D.C. That we have a crisis in Washington, D.C. where people have too much faith in politicians and too little in God. I pray right now that you touch the lives of those who are critical of the police and detectives not knowing that they're only as unlimited in what they can do as people are limited in what they're willing to do. I ask you right now, Father God, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their sons and the hearts of the daughters to their mothers. That we might end this curse in this city, Lord God. It's time now for honesty and for truth. For people to put aside their ideological differences, Lord God. And seek your face. And know that those who do so will be richly rewarded. Bless the family of Tracy Cooper once more, Lord God. And by your will, and by your power, and by your mercy, meet their need. In Jesus' name, we say amen. Ladies and gentlemen, I will be right back right after this speech from the Ronald Wilson Reagan Foundation. I'm here to mark that day in history when the Allied armies joined in battle to reclaim this continent to liberty. For four long years, much of Europe had been under a terrible shadow. Free nations had fallen. Jews cried out in the camps. Romans cried out for liberation. Europe was enslaved and the world prayed for its rescue. Here in Normandy, the rescue began. Here the Allies stood and fought against tyranny in a giant undertaking unparalleled in human history. We stand on a lonely windswept point on the northern shore of France. The air is soft, but 40 years ago at this moment, the air was dense with smoke and the cries of men, and the air was filled with the crack of rifle fire and the roar of cannon. At dawn on the morning of the 6th of June, 1944, 225 rangers jumped off the British landing craft and ran to the bottom of these cliffs. Their mission was one of the most difficult and daring of the invasion, to climb these sheer and desolate cliffs and take out the enemy guns. The Allies had been told that some of the mightiest of these guns were here, and they would be trained on the beaches to stop the Allied advance. The rangers looked up and saw the enemy soldiers at the edge of the cliffs shooting down at them with machine guns and throwing grenades. And the American rangers began to climb. They shot rope ladders over the face of these cliffs and began to pull themselves up. When one ranger fell, another would take his place. When one rope was cut, the ranger would grab another and begin his climb again. They climbed, shot back, and held their footing. Soon, one by one, the rangers pulled themselves over the top, and in seizing the firm land at the top of these cliffs, they began to seize back the continent of Europe. 225 came here. After two days of fighting, only 90 could still bear arms. And behind me is a memorial that symbolizes the ranger daggers that were thrust into the top of these cliffs. And before me are the men who put them there. These are the boys of Pled to Hope. These are the men who took the cliffs. These are the champions who helped free a continent. And these are the heroes who helped end a war. Gentlemen, I look at you and I think of the words of Stephen Spender's poem. You were men who in your quote, lives fought for life and left, left the vivid air signed with your honor. I think I know what you may be thinking right now, thinking we were just part of a bigger effort. Everyone was brave that day. 
Whatever it was, you remember the story of Bill Moon of the 51st Highlanders? Forty years ago today, British troops were pinned down near a bridge waiting desperately for help. Suddenly they heard the sound of bagpipes, and some thought they were dreaming. Well, they weren't. They looked up and saw Bill Mullen with his bagpipes leading the reinforcements and ignoring the smack of the bullets into the ground around him. Lord Lovett was with him, Lord Lovett of Scotland, who calmly announced when he got to the bridge, sorry, I'm a few minutes late, as if he'd been delayed by a traffic jam, when in truth he'd just come from the bloody fighting on Sword Beach, which he and his men had just taken. There was the impossible valor of the Poles, who threw themselves between the enemy and the rest of Europe as the invasion took hold. And the unsurpassed courage of the Canadians, who had already seen the horrors of war on this coast. They knew what awaited them there, but they would not be deterred. And once they hit Juno Beach, they never looked back. All of these men were part of a roll call of honor, with names that spoke of a pride as bright as the colors they bore. The Royal Winnipeg Rifles, Poland's 24th Lancers, the Royal Scots Fusiliers, the Screaming Eagles, the Yeoman of England's Armored Divisions, the Forces of Free France, the Coast Guard's Matchbox Fleet, and you, the American Rangers. Forty summers have passed since the battle that you fought here. You were young the day you took these cliffs. Some of you were hardly more than boys with the deepest joys of life before you. Yet you risked everything here. Why? Why did you do it? Well, what impelled you to put aside the instinct for self-preservation and risk your lives to take these cliffs? What inspired all the men of the armies that met here? We look at you and somehow we know the answer. It was faith and belief. It was loyalty and love. The men of Normandy had faith that what they were doing was right, faith that they fought for all humanity, faith that a just God would grant them mercy on this beachhead or on the next. It was the deep knowledge, and pray God we have not lost it, that there is a profound moral difference between the use of force for liberation and the use of force for conquest. You were here to liberate, not to conquer, and so you and those others did not doubt your cause, and you were right not to doubt. You all know that some things are worth dying for. One's country is worth dying for, and democracy is worth dying for, because it's the most deeply honorable form of government ever devised by man. All of you loved liberty. All of you were willing to fight tyranny. And you knew the people of your countries were behind you. The Americans who fought here that morning, no word of the invasion was spreading through the darkness back home. They fought or felt in their hearts, though they couldn't know, in fact, that in Georgia, they were filling the churches at 4 a.m. In Kansas, they were kneeling on their porches and praying. And in Philadelphia, they were ringing the Liberty Bell. Something else helped the men of D-Day. The rock-hard belief that Providence would have a great hand in the events that would unfold here. That God was an ally in this great cause. And so the night before the invasion, when Colonel Wolverton asked his parachute troops to kneel with him in prayer, he told them, do not bow your heads, but look up so you can see God and ask his blessing in what we are about to do. Also that night, General Matthew Ridgway on his cot, listening in the darkness for the promise God made to Joshua, I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. These are the things that impelled them. These are the things that shaped the unity of the Allies. When the war was over, there were lives to be rebuilt and governments to be returned to the people. There were nations to be reborn. Above all, there was a new peace to be assured. These were huge and daunting tasks, but the Allies summoned strength from the faith 
belief, loyalty, and love of those who fell here. They rebuilt a new Europe together. There was first a great reconciliation among those who had been enemies, all of whom had suffered so greatly. The United States did its part, creating a Marshall Plan to help rebuild our allies and our former enemies. The Marshall Plan led to the Atlantic Alliance, a great alliance that serves to this day as our shield for freedom, for prosperity, and for peace. In spite of our great efforts and successes, not all that followed the end of the war was happy or planned. Some liberated countries were lost. The great sadness of this loss echoes down to our own time in the streets of Warsaw, Prague, and East Berlin. The Soviet troops that came to the center of this continent did not leave when peace came. They're still there, uninvited, unwanted, unyielding, almost 40 years after the war. Because of this, Allied forces still stand on this continent. Today, as 40 years ago, our armies are here for only one purpose, to protect and defend democracy. The only territories we hold are memorials like this one and graveyards where our heroes rest. We in America have learned bitter lessons from two world wars. It is better to be here ready to protect the peace than to take blind shelter across the sea, rushing to respond only after freedom is lost. We've learned that isolationism never was and never will be an acceptable response to tyrannical governments with an expansionist intent. But we try always to be prepared for peace, prepared to deter aggression, prepared to negotiate the reduction of arms, and yes, prepared to reach out again in the spirit of reconciliation. In truth, there is no reconciliation we would welcome more than a reconciliation with the Soviet Union, so together we can listen, lessen the risk of war now and forever. It's fitting to remember here the great losses also suffered by the Russian people during World War II. 20 million perished, a terrible price that testifies to all the world the necessity of ending war. I tell you from my heart that we in the United States do not want war. We want to wipe from the face of the earth the terrible weapons that man now has in his hands. And I tell you, we're ready to seize that beachhead. We look for some sign from the Soviet Union that they are willing to move forward, that they share our desire and love for peace, and that they will give up the ways of conquest. There must be a changing there that will allow us to turn our hope into action. We will pray forever that someday that changing will come. But for now, particularly today, it is good and fitting to renew our commitment to each other to our freedom and to the alliance that protects it. We're bound today by what bound us 40 years ago, the same loyalties, traditions, and beliefs. We're bound by reality. The strength of America's allies is vital to the United States, and the American security guarantee is essential to the continued freedom of Europe's democracies. We were with you then, we're with you now. Your hopes are our hopes, and your destiny is our destiny. Here in this place, where the West held together, let us make a vow to our dead. Let us show them by our actions that we understand what they died for. Let our actions say to them the words for which Matthew Ridgway listened, I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Strengthened by their courage, heartened by their value and born by their memory. Let us continue to stand for the ideals for which they lived and died. Thank you very much and God bless you all. Nothing illustrates America's breakdown like the way the president's hometown celebrates its holidays. Memorial Day, 12 dead, 56 wounded. The 4th of July, 10 dead, 53 wounded. Labor Day, 9 dead, 46 wounded. 
this kind of third world carnage has become absolutely normal. If the president held a press conference every time multiple people were murdered by criminal gangbangers with illegal guns in Chicago, we'd hear from him almost every day. Instead, he says nothing. And the untold secret in Washington is that he has all the laws he needs to stop the bloodshed now. Under the existing federal gun laws, he could take every felon with a gun, drug dealer with a gun, and criminal gangbanger with a gun off the streets tomorrow and lock them up for five years or more. But he won't do it. His Justice Department won't do it. And the media never ask why. So convicted gangbangers carry illegal guns because they fear rival gangs more than they fear being prosecuted for a gun charge. Every police officer on the streets in cities like Chicago, Baltimore, and Detroit knows what it's like to get called to a murder scene knowing full well who did it because the killer was in the back of their car yesterday or last week. Thugs like Darius Brown, who was supposed to be serving a 10-year sentence for second-degree felony robbery, but got let off with five years probation. So he was free to roam the streets and kill a nine-year-old girl while she was doing her homework. If you want to stop violent crime, and I know you do, take violent criminals off the street. Prosecute them under the current federal gun laws and make sure they don't get to their next crime scene. That's the way to save lives. If the president held a press conference tomorrow morning and directed every federal jurisdiction to round up every felon with a gun, drug dealer with a gun, and criminal gangbanger with a gun, law enforcement would have thousands of violent thugs and handcuffs and squad cars by sundown. Instead, he waits for a crime that fits his agenda and blames the NRA. Mr. President, we will not accept blame for your failure. The NRA has demanded the strongest possible prosecution of the federal gun laws for over 20 years. Our repeated calls have been met by deafening silence from the Washington elites. President Obama and Hillary Clinton and other politicians used the carnage to campaign for more gun laws. They won't and don't enforce. And the good, honest Americans living out in farm towns in Nebraska or Oklahoma, or working two jobs in inner city Chicago or Baltimore. People who keep their heads down, raise their kids, and just try to do the right thing, they see through it all. We've lived through the Clinton administration's utter lack of federal gun prosecutions, and the Obama administration is following suit while the country suffers. And we know that a second Clinton administration will just mean more the same. Americans have no tolerance for violent thugs, no tolerance for the politicians who enable them, and no tolerance for a media that devotes endless time to new gun laws, but won't even ask why we don't enforce the existing federal gun laws we already have. No organization has been louder clearer, or more consistent on an urgent need to enforce the federal gun laws than the NRA. And in the face of mounting political and media pressure to demean, shame, and silence us, we will fight. If you have had enough of the dishonest debate, if you're sick and tired of politicians blaming you and your guns for their failure, demand truth and justice. Stand and fight the NRA. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you back to the second half of the Exceptional Conservative Show live from the nation's capital. We are not ashamed of the good news of conservatism, for it is the power of liberation, first to the Republican and then the Socialist. Hopefully you're enjoying the new experience of my website. Yes, I made some alterations to it over the weekend. I hope that you appreciate the blustery attempts to make it much better than it was before. 
Uh, and yeah, I know a lot of people got tired of me telling them to go to the services area in order to hear what's going on. Well, I've changed that. Now we have something called Broadcast Central. You go to Broadcast Central, you can click on, you can listen to us on SHR, on the Spreaker system. You can listen to us directly via Ustream Live. There's also the chat roll there. Uh, and you can click on the chat roll. Uh, thank you, Mary. That's all that matters. When Mary, who is my bouncer, if you diss her, you diss me, you will be dismissed, says, nice, cool. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, dude, y'all can see the wind coming in. That's good. That's good. Uh, <laughs> it's been hot, so that's good. So I want to thank you all so much uh, for paying attention, uh, for joining me here. I, I do want to make a deviation for what I said earlier. As an ombudsman, I want to uh, make a correction on something. I gave a GoFundMe site, um, and... I'm going to make a request of you. Do not send the money to that GoFundMe site. I am going to work with Esther Williams in terms of creating a GoFundMe page to, for funeral expenses for Tracy Cooper. But um, the site has someone named Keith Cooper, C-O-O-O-P-E-R, listed as the organizer. Uh, and there's no Facebook verification of that particular individual. And, and not that it necessarily needs to be, but I, I prefer integrity. I want things to be above board. I want to make sure that the monies that my audience, if, if they're going to send it, uh, goes directly to the funeral expenses for Tracy Cooper. And, and the reason why I say that, forgive me, you all. I, I'm, I know a lot of people say, hey, well, what difference does it make, Ken? It, well, if the Keith C O O O P E R is the actual Keith Cooper, who was charged with being a felon in possession of a firearm because of a prior conviction of unauthorized use of vehicle and a possession with intent to distribute cocaine, uh, and is also under federal charges, uh, and also had a cell phone that found a picture of a 40 caliber silver and black Smith and Wesson pistol lying on a mattress with a blue and pink floral pattern later determined to match the pattern of the mattress in his room uh, if, if that's the person I don't want the money going there uh, because there was numerous text messages that described consistent with drug trafficking and I'm not making any allegate I'm making any assertions I'm not making allegations. I'm just saying for the integrity of the giving. I want to make things are up and above board. We've already had Miss Esther Williams come on. Uh, I will support Miss Esther Williams if she sets up a GoFundMe page in which she has authority on distributing the money. Um, so I want you all to hold off. I know some of you all are like the minute you say, "Kid, I was ready to get my my you know Facebook page and." make a donation I, I want y'all to hold off on just one moment it, it, it could be a typo it could be but I want to make I want to make certain um, that your money is going directly where it's supposed to be I, I'd rather be called every name in the book for being so persnickety than to be the one who told you to go to a GoFundMe page that the money was used for a purpose that was not intended by Esther Williams, Reverend Esther Williams. So uh, I want to make certain that you all understood that uh, and encourage you to give, but hold off on your giving just yet until there is a GoFundMe page set up under the authority of Reverend Esther Williams. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, okay, and, and ladies and gentlemen, Trust me, I have my. I was ready to give too, so I just want to tell you all that. I'm I'm not trying to hold back anything. I know a lot of people get all, and I know Reverend Esther Williams understands exactly what I'm saying here, so I'm not worried about what she thinks. There's some people who just, for God's sake, reason, just hate the fact that I breathe. And want to take things to another level, that's not it. I want to make certain that your money goes to exact purposes. That's, it's my job. 
I want to go to heaven to be able to say that. That's what I did. You can call me anything in the book you want, but that's what I did. Without further ado, we are trying to connect with none other than Lonnie Poindexter. Lonnie Poindexter, who is the host of Lion Chaser Radio on Urban Family Talk. Hello. 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 <laughs> Lonnie Poindexter. Good evening, sir. What's up there, Mr. McClinton? How are you doing? I am doing extremely well. Glad to have you on the air with us tonight. Uh, there is always so much going on in the world around us. Uh, your home state is about to deliver a blistering message to a woman named Hillary Rodham Clinton. I just wanted to get your opinion on why she is so concerned about the good state of California IA. Well, I think she's most certainly concerned because, number one, uh, of all people that are giving her a good run for her money in that state is our lovable socialist, Bernie Sanders. And so it's not necessarily that she has a lock on the state. And then when you consider even what Mr. Trump's doing in that state, um, there is a uh, cost of thought for her. So it's going to be really interesting to see how things play out. You know, uh, when Hillary put her polls out a few weeks ago, she was up by double digits. Uh, however, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, those polls are looking uh, totally different. Uh, and there are some that say that Bernie, feel the burn, Sanders, uh, is going to walk away with 61% of the California vote. Is California that far gone on the socialist bent? Yeah, California, unfortunately, is, is controlled by two regions, that Southern California and the Bay Area. And those two areas, um, unfortunately, drive uh, what the state ends up doing because of the population centers there. Um, the state of California, many your listeners might not be aware of this, but California is largely an uh, agricultural state. In fact, that's what they produce more than anything else. You get outside of those two regions that I mentioned, and it could be uh, Iowa, it could be Louisiana, it could be Texas. Um, very tends to be very conservative because the rural communities are throughout the mid portion of the state in the north uh, northern portion of the state. Um, but we got those two um, bastions of uh, liberalism, which would be the Los Angeles area basin, um, excluding Orange County, but even Orange County has moved more to the left. And then you have San Diego as well. So that's what's driving um, that state. And, it's, you know, I, I'm from there, brother, but I got to tell you, it, I don't speak, how can you put this? Like, it's like you're, it's home, but I don't speak as highly of home as I used to, given some of the shenanigans that take place there. Exactly. Yeah, you all do a wonderful job with getting rid of the water, the fresh water, uh, and saving snails. <laughs> <laughs> you have over, over what, a, a two-inch fish? <laughs> <laughs> great job, great job. Lonnie Poindexter with Urban Family Talk, Lion Chasers Radio. Tell us, Lonnie, what is your show all about and why do millions of people listen to you every single day? Well, our show, the slogan is uh, the intersection between between faith and public policy. Um, we talk about the two things that uh, everyone says that uh, good common sense says not to talk about. That politics and religion, as I'm, as I'm sure you uh, understand, my fellow lion chasers, that um, the reason why we're in the mess room today is because people of faith are not participating in public policy the way we need to. So we have um, the inmates running the asylum. So that's what we discuss day in and day out, Monday through Friday. And we have uh, guests from all across the country, including lawmakers and uh, quite a few um, members of clergy, because we do champion uh, women and women of faith from across the country as well. Exactly. Lonnie, uh, first and foremost, uh, what should a gorilla do when a human falls into their enclosure? <laughs> <laughs> Which you saw the meme that I posted earlier today. He should stand up on his two hind legs and walk away screaming down to the no man no. 
Oh my goodness! Much attention has been given to uh, the killing of the gorilla in Cincinnati. Uh, I'm quite certain more people have are on the list of unresolved homicides in Cincinnati than the gorilla list. Uh, but apparently, the mother is not going to be held uh, uh, responsible uh, for the child falling into the Cincinnati Zoo. I'm quite certain that she's probably suing the Cincinnati Zoo uh, because of the fact that the railing wasn't high enough to keep her son out. Um, but is, is it time for us to now really start taking a hard look at parenting in America? Well, anyone that goes to your local Walmart or any department store today across America has noticed, at least I have, <laughs> um, the general lack of good parenting today, because you look at the, and forgive me for being <laughs> you see a mama in the store with a bunch of little house aches, and, uh, and you want to turn and go the other way. Um, <laughs> There's a general disregard for traditional <laughs> I was wondering if you caught that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did, and, sir. Are, are the parents but, that you, know, you, you know that you, you know that mother's going to coin the suit. She said initially there wouldn't be any repercussions, but now that she knows, um, it, it, I'm sure some attorneys are going to be are, are already talking to her, thinking, you know, that's money we can get from that zoo. Wow, wow, and not just the zoo, the city itself. Uh, this is open open door to the uh, to the treasury. Uh, and when you do go into the Kmarts and the Walmarts of the world, because you're not going into Targets anymore, uh, no. you, you see actual children running the household. Uh, yeah. And that might be more or less uh, the greatest sign of demise in the American culture than anything else. Would you say that, sir? Yeah, I, I would agree with you because the new daddy for um, your average American family today is the government. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, we used to say nanny government, but the daddy government, um, except that the daddy that, um, or, or Star Parker would call the new daddy, is a narcissist. <laughs> um, Self serving and, and, and he only helps his children when he first stated himself. And uh, we moved away from those things that made, us, made our nation great starting with the foundation of civilization, which is family. And today what we have is a baby can fall down, a three-year-old can fall down into an enclosure where a silverback gorilla seemed to have um, more <laughs> attention to the child than mama. And I'm not saying mama didn't love her babies. But, but here, here's a statistic, um, or, or one of the things pertaining to that. Uh, she was a single mother, correct? Yes. Well, no, no. Yeah. Well, she's with, she got a man. <laughs> she, her, ah. her her baby has a daddy, uh, uh, and I believe that they are together, but I don't think they're together the way my mom and dad were. I I don't know exactly. Uh, yeah, you know, I I think they each have keys to the front door. <laughs> <laughs> It's, when there's a strong paternal influence, the children tend to behave better. I mean, maybe I'm a little biased in that regard, but that's how I feel. Yeah. When you knew your dad was going to knock the daylights out of you in public because he really didn't yeah. care, <laughs> behavior was slightly now, different. <laughs> all, all my mother had to say was, I guess I have to talk to your father when, he, when I get home. Yeah. Oh, my God. I was <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was it. <laughs> oh. Oh, mother dear, <laughs> why, why is thou upset? I love you, mother dear. You know, I'm going in the monastery once I graduate grade school. <laughs> well, people don't understand, the worst thing that your mom could do to you uh, after your dad has been in an hour worth of traffic and is coming home is to have you sitting in the living room. That was the worst yep. thing. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. You were not supposed to be in the living room except for punishment. <laughs> now, um, your organization, Urban Family Talk, or at least the, the organization behind Urban Family Talk, uh, has cost the Target Corporation uh, 
almost fifteen billion dollars. They're down today to sixty-eight dollars, and it doesn't look like they're going up beyond sixty-eight tomorrow. Uh, when are y'all gonna start paying them back? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it, it, it was a David versus Goliath moment. I don't think that Target uh, nor its subsidiary uh, took um, a little AFA seriously, but it really speaks to if you just stand up and speak the truth and hold to your convictions that you can see God move through you. So who thought that a little bitty organization out of Tupelo, Mississippi would have the wherewithal to call this major, what is it, forty-some billion-dollar company, humongous company, uh, on the carpet for the, the horrible policy that's putting women at risk. You know, the real war on women is what I call it. Yeah. And um, to see those numbers, I, I, no, I had no idea that the share value would drop so significantly. But see, that's a God thing. That's not an AFA thing, American mm -hmm. Family Association. That's God moving through because I think. People in America, man, for the most part, have common sense. You just need to rattle them a little bit and get them to stand up. It's kind of that Chick-fil-A moment, you know what I mean? Exactly, exactly. And what we're really talking about here is the transgender bathroom. Um, and there was a ACLU lawyer uh, from the Georgia chapter. She was the interim. I, I noticed how they... And the last press releases for her, it was executive director. And the more uh, recent ones, they are interim executive director. <laughs> we didn't really hire her. Uh, but apparently she changed her mind about the transgendered uh, law, or at least the, uh, the arguments for transgender using the bathrooms in accord with the sexual identity that they most identify with and can you tell everyone why this woman had a come to jesus moment in her life yeah her compelling event is it hit very close to home for, for her um, and then common sense has to prevail if you truly have love for your children Three little girls taking them into a restroom. I think she was somewhere in the Bay Area, probably San Francisco. And as I uh, recount the story, um, three transgendered males walked into the restroom, obviously males, bass voices, over six feet tall, each one of them, and it traumatized the children. They began to ask her tons of questions. Mommy, where are those men in the restroom? What are they doing here? And why do they have dresses on? And so, hey, Mommy, I'm afraid. Okay. So that was her moment when... I think common sense prevailed, and she had to get those kids out of there. Um, it's really nice, warm, and fuzzy, Ken, when you think about this whole value proposition, uh, which is this false narrative called the uh, doctrine of tolerance and inclusion. But when it runs head on up against common sense, you get what we had happen with that woman. So she had to ask herself some, in my opinion, deep questions about, okay, what is my stance? And, and, and as I understand it, she began to ask, them at ACLU a question about what was the fallout going to be on this? I mean, where's the line? What about the rights of women and girls? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the rest is history. She had to step aside and she had to uh, resign. Now, you, you know that she's going to catch a ton of heat from the LGBTQ community mm -hmm. over this. In fact, I've already saw some quotes from some transgendered individuals who, I can't say it on the air because they're very profane, you're yeah. calling her all types of names. If you don't roll with the agenda, you're instantly an enemy and you're a hate monger and all this. And uh, so she's going to ask herself some questions because she will be ostracized, not only by that community, but by the liberal community who is walking with this agenda. Uh, and we are talking about uh, the Georgia ACLU leader. Uh, and, and this is amazing. Uh, that she had a come to Jesus moment thanks to her children, Maya Dillard Smith. Yeah. Uh, it seems that the children have a little bit more sense than the adults <laughs> about life. Uh, but I'm coming off the fact that I was down in Texas and at the Texas State GOP convention, 
uh, people were concerned that there would be a flare-up over the transgender bathrooms. Um, and it didn't happen. Um, and, in fact, they passed a uh, platform ruling uh, so that <clears throat> there would not be a, a consideration of transgender bathrooms under state law. Uh, and that passed. Uh, but the biggest flare-up that we are noticing and talking about recently, uh, and one of them majorly, took place uh, last week in San Jose, where Donald yeah. Trump uh, and his ilk at a rally, which is just cause for violence. A am I right? Uh, the the uh, Bernie guys and the leftists just went haywire. They certainly did. I mean, um, Donald Trump, and you and I have talked about our um, uh, concerns about his candidacy, but the reality is um, Donald Trump held a rally uh, there in San Jose in a speaking engagement, and the professional protesters showed up, um, just like they had done down in the San Diego area and other places in California. And uh, the media covers that. You know what's going to be interesting is people did not, or the media did not talk about the number of Trump people who showed up for those events, because record numbers are showing up uh, for his events. They focus on the protesters that are outside. And Ken, have you seen the, um, the screenshots from um, um, the different social media uh, screenshots about the advertisement uh, to pay uh, protesters to go travel to these events for paying them $15 an hour? <laughs> minimum, minimum wage, baby! Hey, if, if Wendy's is going to fire you, you might as well become a protester. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I wanted to talk with you about that. A great segue. We're talking with Lonnie Poindexter, uh, who is the host of uh, Lion Chaser Radio on Urban Family Talk. Uh, heard from coast to coast, city to city, uh, new outlets in Memphis and also Long Island, New York. Congratulations to you. Um. Thank you, sir. I was watching on Fox News on Sunday morning as I was preparing to oversleep for church. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was on top. No, I was. I was late. Uh, but uh, um, a woman was egged. I mean, she was in the in the hotel. Wouldn't let her in. And they were throwing everything at her. And then today I'm watching the news and the Bernie guys are beating up on the Bernie guys. It's, it's, is this chaos? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that segment of society that thinks that stuff for free from the government is the way to go, uh, I would say is, um, <laughs> somebody sent me a meme uh, speaking with this. It said, uh, uh, not a Bernie Sanders uh, supporter. There's a picture of, of someone with dirty hands. I mean, they had just put in a hard day's work. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm obviously not a Bernie Sanders supporter. <laughs> Unless they're entertainers, you know, like, uh, um, like, uh, oh, I can never think of his name um, who's in the, oh, boy, it'll come to me. Eddie, uh, not Eddie, what's his name? Danny Glover. Danny Glover, yes. Danny Glover and some of the, and Michael Moore, who have more money than common sense. And um, these individuals are, Spitting on, spitting, uh, drawing blood, and then for the San Jose Police Department, and I saw some quotes from them was horrible. Uh, uh, did not want to venture in where they should have because they felt it would incite the protesters even more. So, so we are not protesting. You're merely attending an event. You happen to support a candidate that's contrary to the protesters outside, but there's no protection afforded to you by law enforcement because they're afraid of inciting the protesters anymore. Instead of coming in there and cleaning the house and locking those knuckleheads up, which is ridiculous. But it's a call right now that's out for the mayor of San Jose and the police chief to resign. Yeah, and, and they should. They should. And, and let me just, for the San Jose mayor, because we want to be fair. No, I, not really. I don't want to be fair and balanced. I, I just want to be me. Uh, the mayor of San Jose made this point. He said, at some point, Donald Trump needs to take responsibility for the irresponsible behavior of his campaign. We all still holding our breath to see the outcome of this dangerous and explosive situation. 
Bur it, 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 and I want to get your opinion on this. When did we get as a country to the point where words were so provocative that they merit violence? I, you know, it's this new mindset that if you disagree with me, uh, you're wrong, you're a hate monger, you're uh, a hater, uh, you're a bigot, and you see that we have a portion of governance that walks along with this false narrative so that those of us who have a contrary point of view are deemed as the problem. I, I, you know, it just, I, I looked at that and I saw the, 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 the woman you spoke of, what they do, and they spit on this woman, and they all kind of roll up two eggs and everything else at her. And there should have been law enforcement there to protect her. You know what it harkens back to, Kim, is if this kind of foolishness took place back during the Civil Rights Movement, um, when the pioneers were trying to integrate the schools and so forth, and the heinous crowd stood outside, when that um, little girl in the Little Rock Nine and so forth, and did not protect those valiant pioneering individuals who stood up to the racism and walk in. Um, you know, I, I look at that, it, it, what if they, and I'm not saying that the dogs weren't sick on, on the civil rights pioneers, they were, but enough common sense people and law enforcement did the right thing in protecting those, even if they didn't necessarily agree with the position that they were taking. And today, we have everybody walking in lockstep in California as a state, and I know you, you know this, but for our listeners out there, um, industry, business, and people are moving in droves. If you, if you look to the west and you see this large dust cloud over the state of California, that's the uh, that's all the, <laughs> the moving vans and U-Hauls that are beating feet up out of that state for any place but California. Yeah, that's very true, and I know the people of Texas are regretful because <laughs> they're all going to Texas, uh, and they're, bring, they're bringing their their values with them, their California values with them. I, I want to uh, I'll leave on one point, and I, I want to thank you so much for bearing with me here because I there are many weeks that you haven't been on, and I, I just want to take advantage of you this night if you don't mind. Uh, the one last question is about those moving vans uh, from uh, California IA. How is it that the Trump-hating liberals like Whoopi Goldberg and her fellow uh, individual who used to be a Cosby Show uh, star and now has grown up to be a lesbian. Uh, <laughs> why do the Trump-hating liberals... Raven Simone. Raven Simone, exactly. They want to go to Mexico. They, they want to go to Canada. Uh, but American businesses want to go to Mexico. Why is that, sir? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Canada is just what, a, in my opinion, Canada is just the northern state for, for the United States, and it's about as liberal in Canada as um, as California is. And uh, they, they, they all say that, but let me tell you something, they're not going anywhere. Where are you going to go? I mean, where can you go in the rest of the world and get what you can get here in terms of opportunities? Those individuals will be right here. Uh, come whoever's in office, they're just talking because, you know, they have a different worldview, uh, a very skewed world, worldview, and it's just, in, in my opinion, much about nothing. Although I've seen a lot of, a, a lot of folks saying that they'll help them move out. <laughs> I'm one. I'm one. I'm willing to volunteer. I got some leave. <laughs> I'll help you move. Lonnie, how can people listen to your radio show tomorrow morning? They can catch me Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Central, and 8 a.m. on the West Coast, the left coast. And that's urbanfamilytalk.com. Again, urbanfamilytalk.com. And um, it's a two-hour show, and you'll love uh, coming on. And we have the exceptional one who joins me on Fridays. And it's always a hoot when he's on there, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you to come on the tune in and listen anytime. We're also on uh, 11 radio towers across the country, newly added, uh, New York State, where we've got three towers, and also in uh, Memphis now. We're broadcasting out of Memphis as well. Awesome. Congratulations to you, sir. Look forward to having dinner with you. God bless you. Take care, brother. All God right. Bless. Lonnie Poindexter, my, my very good friend. Uh, great radio program, Urban Family Talk. Make it your listening program in the early morning.
Uh, it's Lion Chaser Radio, and I, I'm going to tell you uh, that even Dave is listening to it. Dave will tell you too that it is a wonderful, wonderful program. Great guests, great conversation, um, and certainly not as unruly <laughs> as my program is, and certainly less ruly than Sackheads Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back with more of the best in urban conservative talk. I need to invite you all. I got a lot of news for you. Uh, it's been a long weekend, so I got a lot of news for you. I need to invite you all. Freedom Fest. Well, welcome to Freedom Fest 2015. I think this is the best Freedom Fest we've ever put together. Freedom Fest is truly international. There's people from all over the world that come to Freedom Fest, not just to talk, but also to participate in dialogue, participate in the panels, to participate in the audience. So hold your breath, lock your seatbelts, I hope you're at your Wheaties today. We are enslaved by government mandates. What light bulb you can buy, what car you can drive, how you heat and cool your home to what health insurance. Europe actually has allowed itself to be held hostage of this entire Greek situation. They have the courage to debate. They have debates on foreign policy, on taxes, on what's going on in the world, on how to invest and how to run your own life. Here's an example of restaurants. Don't open a restaurant because it's so competitive you'll never make any money. Really? I mean, been in Chipotle lately? How many believe that Peter Thiel won the argument competition is overrated in America? And how many in favor of John Mackey's response? So here's the moment many of you have been waiting for, myself included, uh, and I think it's the reason why this room is completely packed, all the way to the back as far as I can see. I think I worked about eight years to put together this debate. I have to say, it's, it's really kind of depressing to see people holding up the Reagan story, which is so obviously different if you pay any attention to the story, as that's, that, that's the best argument, really? That's the best argument? And the middle class and the poor are the people you say you care most about are the people who've been hurt the most by these policies because they've had no income growth at all. Thank you. They already left two waters for me. I probably only need one. So I appreciate it. In America today, higher education is controlled by a cartel. And they say, oh, let's take out a loan and pay for this. And no one bothers to tell them that the market for Greek philosophers has been tight for 2,000 years. So in terms of its two major policy objectives, stable prices in a stable economy, the Fed has clearly failed. And if the Federal Reserve actually did the right thing, the market would crash. Every country in the world has a lower corporate tax rate than us. Can we fix that? Uh, this, in my view, is the premier libertarian event in the country. You probably meet the largest cross-section of philosophically based groups of any conference anywhere in the world. Some of the smartest people in our country come together here to discuss the ideas, the challenges. This is an age, a group of individuals. This is all about my It's not about offense, right? The feisty discussions, interesting people to meet. I love it. This is my first time doing anything like this. The only place you get this many people who agree with me. Nobody, I live in New York. Nobody agrees with me. You know, war is not the health of the state. War is the death of, of liberty and freedom. Uh, and that's a mentality that is particularly strong in the Republican Party, but it's also strong in the Democratic Party. I want government to be this small. I want the individual to be this big. We are people when we are at our greatest that we lead by example. We don't jam it down anybody's throat. We don't force them to live our way. We don't nation build. Very interesting. There's a lot of varieties. Hear ye, hear ye. Freedom Fest Court is now in session. We are gathered here in this great sovereign state of Nevada to decide the fate of the country's central bank, the Federal Reserve. Please place your hand on this edition of Forbes 400 Riches. So we bubble many markets, and that is simply mathematically impossible without the Fed creating the money to make it happen. The Fed is guilty, 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 guilty. Court is now adjourned. God bless America. 
and may you always ride on the eagle of freedom. Hallelujah and good night. I'm Joanne Skousen. I'm the founding director of the Anthem Film Festival. And we are in our fifth year. We started in a little room at the, on the 26th floor at Bally's and now we're, we've, we've grown to huge numbers. Um, in fact, we have a fabulous lineup of shorts. Officers can wear a body camera, but uh, you as citizens may not have access to that footage. Live from Las Vegas. We recognize that Freedom Fest is a big tent. Well, I happen to like Rand Paul. I really do. By the way, in some cases, they'll build a new hospital for $1.5 billion. You could build seven hospitals, 10 hospitals, so that if you knew what you were doing. We had almost 300 speakers. Without a doubt, our most successful Freedom Fest ever. And I just, just adore the experience. It's, it's, it's like a saturation of the senses, a saturation of the mind. I've learned so much. I come home with way too many books. I adore Freedom Fest. I'm definitely coming back again next year. My wife and I, Mrs. Biggs and I, are staying at the Jockey Club. Yes. Uh, and we will walk over to Planet Hollywood where Freedom Fest will be sited and held. It is the world's largest gathering of free minds. Freedomfest.com. Freedomfest.com. 855-850-3733. Three seven three three. Listen to the lineup. Uh, you know, Steve Forbes will be there, of course. Uh, Mark Skousen will be there. Uh, good friend, Mark Skousen. Also, uh, George Foreman. Uh, and yes, Muhammad Ali passed away over the weekend. I just want to say that I think his soul matters more than the fact that he won Olympic gold and heavyweight championship belts. That I'm more concerned about, but nevertheless, I digress. Uh, George Foreman uh, will be there. He is the keynote speaker. Andrew Napolitano, judge, will be there. It's going to be huge. Uh, they're adding more people speaking. There were over 300 speakers last year, but it's not like one of those boring, you got to sit through or whatever. There are so many impactful classrooms going on, and the class that I enjoy most is the Saturday morning class that Mark Skousen does. Uh, and I, I encourage you, if you're going to be there, and you're going to be there on Saturday morning, make certain uh, that you sign up for Mark Skousen's uh, class on economics in the future. Uh, and, and it's great breakfast. Mark Skousen is a wonderful human being. It really is. Um, now, also... Uh, Jockey Club is sold out. Our director of advertising and marketing uh, got one of the last rooms. Uh, she was, uh, that's Deborah Blair, she was so moved by what I was saying in January, she went ahead and used her savings to uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, God bless her soul for doing that. Uh, she's going to be work like a slave. She just don't know it yet. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, no. <laughs> uh, she won't. She won't. I, I promise you. Um, but uh, it's going to be a great time had by all. Uh, Sackhead Shaw, Sackhead Clint, Free Socko, they will be there. The uh, Mr. Heckle and Mr. Jive will be there, yes, none other than the underground professor, Dr. Michael Jones, will be in attendance and broadcasting. We're hoping to get a few other uh, of the broadcasters together uh, because we get to sit and kiss the ring of Dan the Man Butcher. That's right. Uh, Jane does all his work, but Dan the Man Butcher and his wife Jane will be there. It is going to be a huge gathering. I'm encouraging you all to participate in it. Uh, make your way if you can, uh, and if you will, uh, to Las Vegas, July 13th through the 16th. Um, I want to, if I didn't tell you all before, uh, my wife will, and I will be staying there on the 17th. We're going to fly to Los Angeles and come back on Sunday. 
Uh, and then I'm going to have to fly to Cleveland because I will be speaking at the Republican National Convention for Open Heart Closed Case. And I'm working that out right now with the uh, Texas Convention of Black Mayors. Uh, and Craig, frankly, uh, I am honored and pleased. I want to thank everybody uh, for encouraging and inviting. And they're working on the details regarding that. I'm looking forward to attending. Uh, thank you, Dave. Thank you. I think my news was bigger than the breaking news of Hillary winning. I thought Hillary had already won. Uh, this is just uh, a mere matter of counting at this point. And for those of you who are living in Ward 7 and Ward 8, I know that you all have a big election coming up on the 14th of June. Uh, but I think there's a... I have some concerns regarding the Ward 8 election. Uh, the Ward 8 election, my friends, uh, quite frankly, I, get this now. Get this. They've been doing early voting. And the reason why they did early voting is because there was some type of discrimination against people uh, not, not being able to vote on the same day that the election was. So instead of being able to vote absentee, they have an early voting period. Okay. I don't know why absentee doesn't work, but apparently that was impossible for people to do, so they have early voting. So they have like a week's worth of early votes that they were getting in Ward 8, and they were putting them in the voting box, of course. <clears throat> Vote Vermin Supreme. I think they should. Uh, so in Ward 8, uh, under tight security, the voting box was being held. Somehow, someone broke in to the school where the voting box was and stole the voting box. They later found votes strewn along the street in Ward 8. I'm just saying to you all, I think something's up. The gig is up with this election in Ward 8. I think something smells. It's like a tremendous mackerel odor. Uh, so I don't know about you, and some of you all believe that you're both going to count. I, and I... I don't like to be one of those guys who says the fix is in. Uh, I'm just saying that in California, they're saying that Hillary Clinton has already won the nomination and they haven't even voted yet. Amazing. Uh, so it's amazing when you watch Democrats do to Democrats what they should be doing to Republicans or have been doing to Republicans all these years. Voter fraud. Voter fraud is a major concern during this time of the year. So uh, I'm just going to tell you all in Ward 8, something smells real bad about this upcoming election. Now, if you all sit back and allow the election to flow the way it is, God bless you with whatever you get. But I, I would be very irate right now that the early votes were strewn in the street. Thrown in the street. I suppose they might pick them up and count them. I don't know. Eh? Whatever it takes to get a winner across. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, other big news is my website. Can I take a moment and talk about my website? because I'm coming to the end, and the thing that I want to talk with you about, about D.C. statehood, which is, um, according to Cato, and I'm going to encourage everyone uh, to give everyone a history lesson. It's from the uh, National Interest Magazine. Roger Pollan uh, wrote this particular article. I really think that you all should take it uh, by note, just in case somebody walks up to you from out of town uh, and tells you, uh, that they're from Washington, D.C., and they want you to make D.C. a state, you can tell them that the Constitution does not allow Washington, D.C. to ever be a state. Uh, and no way, in no shape, 
in no form and no capacity. Uh, and when Hades freezes over, uh, <laughs> when Hades freezes over, by golly, that's when DC will be a state. And I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say this right here. Um, one of the problems that we have in Washington D.C. regarding violent crime is the ideological pursuits of individuals. No matter how many times you see it written on the wall that we're going the wrong way on the one-way street, there are people that will turn the wrong way on the one-way street because their politics say that they should. The District of Columbia has at least 33 jobs programs uh, from different agencies that overlap one another with over $30 million to help in terms of training people to get off the streets and get a job. That's not why we have our violence problem. The reason why we have our violence problem is a heart condition. A heart condition that seeks to do evil at the demise of the society around it. Miss Cooper is not the only woman in Washington DC where there is a large segment of women raising young men who have decided to do their own thing in their own way uh, and will not have any condemnation from a paternal um, segment. And they stay away from the church because, quite frankly, the church would require them to be obedient to the Lord, and they think themselves God. So the violence continues because we have a city that doesn't want to put the hammer down with law enforcement. They do not want to take repeat offenders off the street. They do not worry about murder until it comes to their home. They don't believe in being a neighbor unless it's beneficial for them. So yeah, I think there's some hearts that need to be changed in Washington, D.C. Why am I tough on ministers? Because ministers ask for the toughest job in all the world outside of being a mother or a father. And that is to be fathers to the fatherless. There are a lot of fatherless young men and women out there today who need you. I know you sat on the end of the bench so you could get your PhD doctorate degree from Dallas Theological Seminary so that you might be able to uh, befuddle the scholars in your midst with biblical testimonial studies. The bottom line is your society is going to hell in a handbasket. That's where you need to be. That's where we ought to be and open heart closed case will be. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm encouraging you all. If your church is still closed, and I'm not talking about the doors, I'm talking about the hearts. Pray that their hearts are open. We have a sick society that we need to heal. We have a murderous society that we need to judicially handle. And we have a people in great need of love. Ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow night, thanks to the help of Jason Miller, uh, who pointed me in the direction of the communications officer, Mr. Sebastian, for this wonderful Arizona GOP challenger for the U.S. Senate, uh, Dr. Kelly Ward will be on the air with us tomorrow night, and we will be talking about a lot of things that are going on around the world and here at home. Uh, so while you might want to give up on the California watch, uh, since we already know who's won the election, <laughs> uh, you might just want to tune in and listen to who might upset John McCain in Arizona in August, I believe. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to go with you on my site. Let's take a tour real quick. I want you to go all the way to the top of the page, the exceptional conservative show dot com. The exceptional conservative show dot com. I want you to go there. Uh, if you're in broadcast central, go to page one, go to the home page, if you would. If you're not, 
uh, even on my site, you're listening to it at Spreaker someplace or whatever, or somebody else's. I want you to go to the Exceptional Conservative Show dot com, and I want you to see the stuff I've put together for you on our homepage. Uh, of course, you have that beautiful picture of me. Uh, <laughs> for we are not ashamed of the good news of conservatism or my photograph. Uh, I give you a little information about the exceptional one, the times of my programming, The Exceptional Conservative Show, which you can hear Monday through Wednesday at 9.05 p.m. Eastern Time. New Day Black and Red on Thursdays at 9.05 Eastern Standard Time. And that's in the p.m. hour. That's with Dr. Michael Jones. And an American Conservative's Exploration of the Inspired Word of God on Sundays at 7.05 a.m. You might note also that there is uh, places where you can click on the shop at Amazon, especially for Father's Day gifts. Women, you can shop on Amazon, too. I made certain dresses and shoes included along with the books for conservatives. Uh, and remember, get your dad something nice for this Father's Day weekend. you got to cross Broadcast Central. At Broadcast Central, you can listen to this show via SHR Media. Uh, you can also watch via Ustream. Uh, and there's a catalog of great shows. You can also... Uh, click on Amazon for your gift card. You can also cr go to Christian Books, get your Bibles, your gifts, your music, your resources, everything Christian for less. And you can create your own ring. Since it's Marian season, create your own ring right there. If you scroll down, you'll also be able to click on the Exceptional Conservative Show, like that uh, segment on Facebook, and also Open Heart Closed Case. You can like that. I really would appreciate it. Now, info about us. You can go to the info page. You'll see all our beautiful pictures. Uh, and me, yeah, yours truly, founder and host. You also see Garfield Williams, the vice president of public relations. If you want me to go someplace to speak, you can contact him. Deborah Frazier is listed there, vice president, advertising and marketing. Uh, you'll also see down there Dr. Michael Jones, the underground professor. Shannon Wright, Baltimore GOP nominee for city council president. She'll be on Wednesday night. Ralph Chittam Sr., D.C. GOP vice chairman. He'll be on Wednesday nights. Janice Hall, Tuesday nights she'll be on. She's the official world news commentator uh, of the Exceptional Conservative Show. Lonnie Poindexter from Lion Chaser was on tonight. And Dr. Brooks Robinson is the official economist of the Exceptional Conservative Show. You'll see the Voice of Liberty page. If you go there, you can also become a subscriber. Well, not a subscriber, but an advertiser on our show for $100 a month. But there's more details about that. You can get in contact with us. But you also will get all of the great writings that we have for uh, the Voice of Liberty. And finally, you can go to the contact page and find out how to get in contact with me should you have any questions or concerns regarding the Exception Conservative Show or any of its programs. And guess what? You can go down to the bottom. You'll see all the networks that we're on. If you're considering to advertise with us, remember, SHR Media, High Plains Pundit Media, Internet Conservative Radio Network, we rebroadcast re upon. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, oh, yeah, one other thing. Clothes by Mrs. Biggs, hair by V Beauty. There you go. Uh, <laughs> a friend of mine once told me, Ken, always be brave. I promise you, I always will. Without a shadow of a doubt. I want you all to understand that we've reached an age in our society where we have to realize that God has already blessed us. It's time for us to bless God. Have a wonderful night. Come back tomorrow night uh, when we conversate with Dr. Kelly Ward, the young woman who will be taking the spot or, or at least challenging for the spot, of uh, Senator from the great state of Arizona. Good night. God bless. We'll see you tomorrow night.